Headline edition, July 8th, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Headline edition will bring you special reports and interviews in a moment. How do you define a mystery? To the good people of New Mexico and many others involved in the story you are about to hear, with one word, Roswell. As you will hear, Roswell has become synonymous with possibly one of the most important events of all time. But first, we're going to build a case for you, in its way as painstaking as any court case ever decided. It's the case for an amazing event and the extreme measures military authorities took to suppress it. As for any jury, you will take your time and attention to follow the evidence. You might find it difficult to follow at times, but it will become evident that one other word summarizes this entire event. Cover-up. The case begins with our sketching of background. We have to return to an America two years after victory in her greatest war. We have to return to a time when the predicted post-war depression wasn't happening after all. When the last shreds of Eastern Europe's independence were being torn away and the Cold War got really chilly. When a single Paris fashion designer would decree all hemlines down. When city dwellers slept in parks to escape summer heat. And when the press had a real tradition of filling the hot weather news stories with hopes and fads and wonders. During the latter part of June and early July of 1947, newspapers throughout the country carried accounts describing the arrival of the flying saucers. Witnesses would describe from one corner of the country to the next flying disks, crescent-shaped objects, metallic, that defied conventional explanation. Military pilots were placed on 24-hour call. Radar operators were on 24-hour standby, all glancing upward, skyward, hoping that what was presently invading our airspace served no new threat. July 4th, a severe lightning storm in the central part of New Mexico. What's significant about New Mexico is that in 1947, it was probably the most sensitive, most highly guarded area of the world. Not only did you have ongoing atomic research at Los Alamos, but you had all the rocket tests just to the south at White Sands in Alamogordo. And in Roswell itself, you had the headquarters of the 509th Heavy Bombardment Group. This was the unit who just two years before had dropped the two atomic bombs on Japan. Little did they know that they would also be involved in one of the most significant, most historic events of all time. The crash of an unknown object late evening of July 4th, between 11 and 11.30, at the height of the storm, when an object was actually tracked on radar in a flash, and it would go off the screen. Local ranchers would describe hearing a loud explosion that didn't sound like the other thunderclaps at that time. Civilians would actually arrive at the site first. Some would attempt to report it to the local sheriff. Others would later describe what they saw. But they would wait many years before finally admitting it to their closest family members and friends. The facts that still defy a reasonable, conventional explanation. Because as you are about to hear, these people believe that they actually recovered a flying saucer. Soon after sunrise on July 5th, a local rancher by the name of Mac Brazo, riding out through the particular ranch that he served as a foreman, just south of Corona, New Mexico in 1947, discovered a debris field that was so 
massive in the area it covered that by the very appearance of the material, it was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. A debris field that covered an area three quarters of a mile long by a few hundred feet wide. He would get down from his horse and examine the material. And he had never seen anything like it before. According to my dad, there was a bad thunderstorm the night before. And the next day he was out on the ranch and he found this debris. And he picked it all up in his pickup and was talking to people. And of course there was some talk about UFOs. He was going to Roswell. And as far as I know, he got in touch with the Sheriff's Department. They, in turn, called the Air Force. Then the Air Force got with Dad and uh, swore him to secrecy, and they came out to the ranch and picked up this debris. Wood, I call it wood. I don't know what it was. It was something like balsa wood, but uh, it wouldn't burn and I couldn't cut it with my knife. He would then take some of the material and go to his nearest neighbors. Floyd and Loretta Proctor lived 10 miles from his ranch at that time. Loretta Proctor still lives at that same ranch and vividly recalls Mac Brazel bringing some of the material for her and her husband to examine. The PC brought us with Proctor, kind of a tan, light brown, Plastic is what it looked like. This we have no plastic now, back then we didn't have any plastic with it that I knew of. And then he had the, there was something he described as uh, tape. He said kind of like a piece of tape that had printing on it. It wasn't, wasn't, uh, writing as we knew it, and it wasn't Japanese writing, you know, it suggested maybe that it might have been a Japanese book or something. He said the writing wasn't like Japanese writing, but it was, I imagine, more like hieroglyphics or something like that, the way he described it. After receiving similar advice from other neighbors, Mac Brazel made the long trek down the Roswell. He there reported it to the Chavez County Sheriff, George Wilcox. Shortly thereafter, radio station reporter Frank Joyce from KGFL places a phone call to the Sheriff's office. The Sheriff suggests there's someone here I think you should talk to. Brazel then describes to Joyce the extent of the debris with both anger and fright. And Joyce suggests he reported to the 509th. It clearly was a military matter. So I got a call from a man who, uh, on the ranch, now once again we're gonna get into something here. Uh, I don't try to go into details about what he said to me or what I believe he said. But he was reporting some uh, uh, wreckage, let's call it wreckage, on his ranch. And he asked me, and he was quite a, well, uh, I guess I could say upset. He asked me what to do about it. And I recommended that he talk to all these. After listening to some of the things he was saying, he's saying uh, certain things which uh, I really would ordinarily be very skeptical about. You know, when you work at a radio station, a TV station, you get all sorts of calls from uh, people, and uh, some of them uh, may be a little strange. <clears throat> so I recommended just generally speaking here without trying to go into a lot of details, that he go to certain authorities. And I finally got him around to, I suggested that with whatever he was talking to me about, <clears throat> that he contact the Roswell Army Air Force Base. As I said, they're flyers, they'll know what to do about anything that flies. One of the sheriff's daughters, Elizabeth Talk, remembers the day the rancher brought the material to her father's office. 
When we arrived, why, uh, I noticed that there were jeeps and some people, you know, from the Air Force there. And, uh, of course, I went right in with my small child, and my husband, Jay, went into the office, and he said to my father, what's going on, George? And he said, well, we've had a man come in uh, saying that there is a flying saucer and bringing a piece of things and said, uh, I don't know what it is, and said, we're investigating it. And uh, he said, uh, what was it? And he said, well, uh, it looked like a burnt grass, like burnt grass out there. But as the years went along, Mother would always say, and I also know of an article that she wrote that said, uh, we do not, as to this day, know that there, whether it was a flying saucer or what, because they told a, my husband, Mr. Wilcox, that she would say, don't you say a word. So he, he didn't, and he was very calm about it. I mean, he just didn't say anything. Who told him not to say a word? Uh, the Air Force did. When they came and picked up the piece or whatever they did, she said they uh, recommended him. That's what the words were in the little article she wrote. Another daughter, Phyllis McGuire, not only remembers the material, but also remembers two of the deputies being sent out to investigate the incident and their reaction when they reported back to her father. So you read about this flying saucer incident in the, in the newspaper and you went and talked to your father him, about and it. asked him about it. And, uh, what did he tell you? And um, I asked him, uh, do you think this is true? And uh, he said, I don't know why Brazel would have come all the way in here and brought that stuff if it hadn't been something important and that he didn't, that he it had to be something that he thought was that. And he had sent deputies out to see about it. What happened? Did he say and anybody he sent, sent the deputies And he out? sent the deputies out. And <clears throat> I think, I'm of the opinion that he sent the deputies out once and that they um, saw a large uh, black area, blackened area, the grass, the range land, and that they came back because it was dark. And then when he, when they came back, he had to wait till the next day to send them back again to find something else. And when they went back again, uh, the army had blocked it off and would, didn't let them in. After almost 50 years, it's become quite apparent by other family testimony that the sheriff, as well as his office, was involved to a much higher degree than anyone had ever suspected. One of the more frightening accounts, as described by his granddaughter, Barbara Duggar, suggests that the military went to most extreme measures to not only silence these people, but to ensure that they never talked about this event ever again. One evening we were watching TV, and it was uh, on TV there was something about space. And my grandmother looked over at me and she said, Barbara, do you believe in anything you know, outside of the earth, and I said, you know I do. And she said, well, I have something that I would really like to tell you, but I don't want you to ever discuss this or tell anyone, because I've never told anybody. And I said, fine, what do we, what do you need to tell me? And she, you know, I, I thought it was going to be something completely different than what she told me. And she said, uh, in the 40s, there was a spacecraft, a flying saucer is what Big Mom called it, uh, crashed outside of Roswell. I said, how do you know about it, Big Mom? And she said, your grandfather, George, was in the sheriff at the time. And I said, well, I don't have any idea. I said, what more about it? And it, she was very hesitant to talk about it, but you knew that within her, there was something that she really needed to tell me. She sat there for quite a while, and then she looked at me, and she said, I'm just going to tell you. And she said, but don't tell anybody. And I said, who would I tell anyway? I don't know anybody to tell. And she said, the reason that I'm telling you this is because when the incident happened, 
the military police came to the courthouse, to the jailhouse, and told George and I that if we ever told anything about this incident, talked about it in any way, that not only we would be killed, but the family, that they would cut, they would get the rest of the family. She was there and witnessed the police or yes, the military she come was, in. Yes, when she she was standing there with my grandfather, I said, "Did you hear them say that, Big Mom?" That's what I called mm -hmm. her, and she said, "Yes, I did, Barbara." What happened is someone came and told my grandfather of this incident that had happened outside of Roswell. My grandmother stated that my grandfather went out there to the site. When he got out there, there was a big burned area when they first approached the area. And then they saw debris. He saw debris. I don't know if he was alone. She was not with him. He went by himself. She said that it was kind of like in the evening. And then he, when he came back, he, uh, she, I asked her, I said, you know, out of jokingness, did he see any little space beings? And she said, yes, there was four of them. And I asked her, I said, what did they have on Big Mom? And she said that they had on the, they were like gray. And Granddaddy said their heads were large. And the little suit that they had on was just, you, you couldn't, it was just like um, silk or something, like that kind of material. But it was, they were gray. And I asked her what happened after that. And she said he came back into town and they, I guess they had discussed this incident and they had thought it was fine to put it over the news, to talk about it. And then apparently something happened and it was not okay. And when they knew that he had gone out there and seen the site and seen this situation that they had talked about, Big Mom said that they were on him like you wouldn't believe. And they came into the jailhouse and told him, you don't say anything, George, and if you do, you will die, and so will Inez and the children, and those children. And I said, did you believe him? She said, what do you think? Heeding the advice of reporter Frank Joyce, the sheriff would contact the local base. There, the intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel, would receive the first information about the rancher's find. He and the company of a counterintelligence officer, Captain Sheridan Cabot, would go to the sheriff's office examine some of the material and there at the advice of the base commander Colonel William Blanchard would follow the rancher back to the debris field. From one piece of metal, what looked like metal anyway, it was not flexible but it was as thin as a fall of a pack of cigarettes. It was that thin. One of my boys told me, said there's something unusual here. He said, uh, I tried to make a dent in this metal. And he says, you can't bend it. You can't make a mark on it. He says, I took a sledgehammer and, and whammed it. I put it on the ground and whammed it. And the, sledge, <laughs> the sledgehammer bounced off of it. Having sent Cavett ahead to the base, Marcel would stop at his home, which was en route back to the base. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, July 8th. There, he would rouse his wife and his son, Jesse Jr., who was then 11 years old. They would go to the kitchen, where they would find the table as well as the floor, covered with this most unusual debris. He had something he wanted to show us. This uh, apparently was some debris or something he brought in from the field uh, at that time. And I understand he was on his way to the air base to deliver this, but he felt that this was unusual enough that he wanted us to see it first before he delivered it to his proper destination. And what happened uh, What happened after he woke you up? And well, he was, uh, as I recall, very excited. And uh, again, he said, I want to show you something. And uh, uh, so I got my, my house coat on, as did my mother. And uh, he had gone out to the car and brought back in some metallic debris. I believe it was in a box. I know. Uh, I don't recall whether I walked outside with him or not, but uh, he made it seem like the, the 1942 Buick we had was loaded with the stuff uh, in the back seat and in the trunk area. At any rate, uh, he brought the material in and spread it on the kitchen floor and uh, in an effort to try to piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle to get some idea of the form of this. But 
unfortunately there was too much of it, too finely divided to do that. There was a lot of rather thick foil-like material, uh, kind of a, not a uh, shiny aluminum, but uh, burnished or a uh, slate gray type of aluminum metal. Uh, there was a black plastic type debris, like Bakelite, which was shattered. It was very brittle material. And then there were uh, fragments of what appeared to be I-beams. Uh, relatively small, but uh, the typical I-beam type configuration. The most unusual part of this whole thing was what was on the I-beam, on the inner surface of an I-beam. Because uh, as you look at it head on, there appeared to be a type of writing in the, on the mainframe itself. Uh, this writing was uh, definitely a purplish violet hue. Uh, it did have uh, an embossed appearance because you could, if I recall, you could rub your finger along it and you could tell it, it had texture. Uh, I don't recall any seeing any lines or letters of any kind, but it was more like geometric shapes. During mid-morning July 8th, First Lieutenant Walter Hott, the public information officer at Roswell, received a strange phone call from the base commander, William Blanchard, ordering him to put out a press release, a press release describing the actual recovery of a flying saucer. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard, and in essence, he told me that uh, we had an he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea of where it came from and <clears throat> ranch north west of Roswell. Then stated that uh, Major Marcel, Jesse Marcel, who was our base intelligence officer, was going to fly it to Fort Worth to turn it over to General Roger Ramey, who was commander commanding general of the 8th Air Force at that time in Fort Worth. And what did Colonel Blanchard want you to do? <clears throat> he told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. Lydia Sleppy worked at KOAT in Albuquerque in 1947. After the press release announcing the recovery of the flying disc was released, they attempted to put it on the wire service. Little did she know that they were in violation of some of the strictest security codes at that time. Lydia Sleppy describes. And he told me he had something hot for the network. I got into it enough to know that this, it was a pretty big, pretty big story. When, if you wanted an interruption on this teletype, if you wanted the operator to stop, or you needed, you know, to feed something in, there was a signal bell that you turned on, and this bell came on, and the typing came across. This is the FBI. You will immediately cease transmitting. Judge Roberts was a reporter at KGFL in 1947. He remembers receiving numerous phone calls pertaining to the wire recording they had made of the rancher Mac Brazo describing the event. Phone calls relating threats as to their broadcasting that report. Judd Roberts still remembers. I don't know whether I should say this or not, but it was true. We hid out the rancher for one night. We were aware of that. Yeah. Where? Yes, and we, we, did, a, we did some transcriptions with him and so mm -hmm. forth. Good old wire recorders, if you will. Where did you hide him out? We had him out at Mr. Whitmore's house here in town. He lived out outside of the city limits on the east side. So you were present at the actual interview? I was not. You were not. Right? I was trying to run the station at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, you, uh, we, we understand that you have some information and uh, we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy and so we suggest that you not do it. And he said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. 
That wire recording of Mac Brazo was confiscated by the military. Mac Brazo himself would then be taken to the base, where he would be detained for the next seven days. He later would complain to neighbors that he was asked the same questions over and over again, that he felt as though he were in jail, and that he was escorted through town, not only to the radio stations, but to the newspapers, retracting his original story. Frank Joyce, the first reporter to actually speak with Brazo, remembers how Brazo came to the radio station and would now tell a different story. I think the next significant thing as far as I'm concerned, it was dark. I got a phone call again, it's Brazil. And he is saying in a very clear voice, you know, very, very loud, well, look, uh, this story is, um, you know, we haven't quite got this story right, and I don't know whether it was that night or the next night. He wanted to come over and talk to me. So I said, okay, come over to the station. And that's where I said, look, you know, it's a very interesting story or something in effect, and, and uh, however, it's nothing at all like, or it's completely different from, uh, the story you told me on the phone the other day, especially about something, I, uh, you know, the, the little where I said to him, the little green men, and that's where he said, yeah, it, only they weren't green. Lyman and Marion Strickland were neighbors of Mac Brazo at that time. In fact, Lyman would return home shortly after the incident and describe to his wife, observing Mac Brazo escorted through town by military officials. Later they would learn from Brazo himself where he had been and why he appeared to be in the trouble he was. Marianne Strickland describes the comments that Mac Brazo made to them after returning from his detainment at the base in Roswell. Mac was very secretive and I know that he made it plain that uh, he was not supposed to tell this and not supposed to tell that and I think most of what he was not supposed to tell was that there was any excitement about this material. Mm -hmm. Now that's my recollection. But Mac was pretty unhappy? Oh you bet. He was a man who uh, had integrity. Um, he was, he definitely felt insulted. And, and misused and disrespected. Master Sergeant Lewis Rickett, assistant to the counterintelligence officer Sheridan Cabot, was not on the base at that time. Rather, he was on assignment down in Carlsbad. But upon returning the next morning, the morning of July 8th, Cabot suggested that he wanted his first hand impression, not to the debris field, but rather to the impact site a separate site that was much closer to Roswell, the site separate from the debris field, the location where the remains of the actual craft and crew were recovered. When Rickett described the half-hour drive just north of town, he said that it appeared that they had already cleaned up most of the site and that there was still some debris present. He described the debris as follows. Right out there, they had some that point they had some of the, the, the uh, military police there and they had a number of them scattered all around and we it looked like to me that there's something they, they said that had landed and there was a little pipe of things lying all around and I asked Cabot I said what's going on he said well that's what we're this is what the guy said something and landed here it is but he saw me come out here so uh, they had air police scattered all the way around the perimeter and the whole thing was down below the, the level of the rise and it was just like a kind of depression through the it was a natural depression it wasn't a, that thing didn't cause it did cause a little bit but the material that we saw just don't make it, it had, Whatever it caused it, it was just like whatever there, it was just uh, vaporized. 
some of them are curved, some of them are flat. They, uh, I know that I walk around to the other side over the distance and up to where these air police, where they, at that time it was the military police, you know, the provost marshal's office. And they were, had kind of a semi guard out there allowing nobody in or out. And they gathered up that stuff as far as I can remember. And I know that it was just as, it wasn't pliable, it was just as hard as it could be and just as light as it And uh, it was uh, enough there that they put some in a, uh, I don't know what kind of, some kind of a weapons carrier, I think they called it, or a truck that the military had. And they put it in there and the major took it. A plane came in, and this time Kevin was running the whole thing, and uh, they left. I heard various other sources that I'm not sure about, but I do know that later on, uh, I asked Joe Worth, who was head of the 700 CIC, and uh, whatever happened to all that metal, he says, that <laughs> we should wouldn't ask me that. He said, we sent it over to a lab, and they don't know either. The American Broadcasting Company and affiliated stations present Headline Edition with Taylor Grant. From all over the world, wherever the day's headlines are made, Headline Edition brings you accurate, timely reports on the news behind those headlines, plus informative in-person interviews with the men and women who made the headlines today. Today's edition presents a roundup of the latest developments in the finding of a flying disc. Stay in step with history in the making. Stay tuned to Headline Edition. And now, here's Taylor Grant. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange disks had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the disks which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disk landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disk looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying saucer to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box kite. He says that it was so battered that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tinfoil. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. The disc also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. There was important activity within... First Lieutenant Robert Shirky had been at the base in 1947 and had watched as some of the wreckage had been taken through the operations building and out onto the ramp where it was loaded into an aircraft. The call came in one day to arrange to have B-29 ready to go as soon as possible. And of course someone asked uh, where to. I said, just get a crew on board and uh, have the airplane stand by and we're going to go to Fort Worth. And it was, that was Colonel Blanchard's directive. At any rate, I was in that operations office and Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one of the fellow there, who was now dead, uh, 
said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. And with this, he turned, stepped out and back into the hallway and w waved to some people outdoors and still sitting in the automobiles. They came in the front door, straight down the hallway and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. And these were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, uh, UFO today, that uh, I got to see. Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office, and I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways, I want to see too. <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> so he just turned and looked at me, and he did turn sideways so that I could half step into the doorway and watch the fellows go through. And what I, thus I saw them carrying certain pieces of these metals, brushed stainless steel. Maybe if you think of the uh, common aluminum foil roll today, when you pull it out, uh, one side's real reflective, but that's not what it was. It was the, like the opposite side, which is rather dull. I've heard it mentioned now for so many times about the uh, I-beam with the markings on it and so forth. And I actually saw that piece of I-beam being carried through and, and uh, saw the markings. Upon orders from Brigadier General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force at Fort Worth, Texas, the commanding office of the 509th. Marcel was to bring some of the material to his attention at Fort Worth. According to Robert Porter, a crewman on that flight, there were only four small packages. They had checked the aircraft a B-29 and then a staff car from building 1034, which brought the material out and loaded it onto the plane. We flew the these pieces, they told us it was a parts of the flying saucer, and we flew from Roswell to Fort Worth. Uh -huh. And it, we started out, they told us we'd be going to Wright Patterson in, in Ohio. Uh -huh. And we got to Fort Worth, and they transferred them to B-25 and, and took them on to Wright Patterson. And uh, what did you do then? Then we returned to Roswell. Okay. Who, who do you recall was on board that B-29 when you left Roswell? Uh, Colonel Jennings was on board, and, and Colonel Barraclaw, Major uh, Wonderlick, and uh, uh, Major Marcel was uh, ones up front. Okay. And and who was it who told you that these these were pieces of a flying saucer? I don't remember just uh, who it was, but uh, it must have been Captain Henderson. What was it that was actually loaded on board that you saw? Well, we had uh, it's just packages and uh, wrapping paper, uh -huh. and one of them was triangle shaped, about two and a half feet uh, across the bottom, and the rest were in smaller packages, uh, about the shoebox size. Uh -huh. What was your feeling when you? Well, it was just <laughs> like uh, picked up an empty package. Is that uh, right? right? Very light. Colonel Thomas Jefferson DeBose was General Ramey's chief of staff at Fort Worth in 1947. He would receive a phone call from the Pentagon, directly from General Clements McMullen, instructing them to switch the actual material to substitute a very common radar reflector kite suspended from a weather balloon. There's no doubt in your mind, I gather, that the balloon story was a cover story. Absolutely not. We knew that it was a cover story, and, and if, whose idea it was, I, I have the faintest, the faintest idea, but we used that in order to uh, assuage the curiosity of the press, because this had gotten out and the Fort Worth Star Telegram, Dallas News, and the UPI, and well, the three press three. release from Roswell, Blanchard's press release. Yeah, well, yeah, there are all these pictures from Roswell. You see, all this created a lot of hubbub, and and Eighth Air Force headquarters had to be the hub. The guys to go to 
going to ask. The president, somebody along the line is going to say, Who, who's running this show? And it comes up to the 8th Air Force, Rainey and, and his, or his chief of staff. Somebody in there has got to know something about it. The B-29 transported actual wreckage and debris directly to Wright Field. Wright Field at that time was the headquarters of the Foreign Technology Division. Foreign Technology did all the reverse engineering of captured weaponry from World War II. Then, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Exxon was with the Foreign Technology Branch. He remembered the material coming in. He also remembered the reaction of the boys in the lab, as he put it, and their conclusions after examining the material. As a result of that, uh, uh, I know there was, they saw the one sighting, and then there was where there a good bit of the information came down, and then uh, uh, there was another, another location where there was apparently the main body of the spacecraft uh, was where they did say that there were bodies uh, there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I've been in, uh, I've gotten several information that I think it may be more rumor than fact mm-hmm. about what happened to those uh, bodies, although they were all found and apparently outside of the, of the craft itself, mm-hmm. but, was, but were in fairly good uh, condition. In other words, they weren't broken up a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, they, and they came into Wright-Patterson. Well, that's my information, of it, but one of them was that it went to... Uh, Back at the impact site, Sergeant Melvin E. Brown and another MP were stationed behind an ambulance truck with orders not to look inside. His daughter, Beverly Bean, remembers. It's almost as if when he'd actually told the story, he wished he hadn't. All available men were grabbed. That's that his actual words I'm saying here now that I can remember. All available men were grabbed. They all had to go out to the desert where a, a crash saucer had come down. and. Um, 
They all had to stand, uh, stand guard duty around this site. They were told to look, but not look, not to take anything in. He lifted up, um, him and this other guy both lifted up the cover and saw, I say two bodies, but my sister remembers him as saying three. We, we disagree on that. Um, they saw these bodies and uh, they were about four foot tall, no more than that, maybe even less. Uh, much larger heads than we have, slanted eyes, yellowish skin. Local mortician Glenn Dennis worked at the Ballard Funeral Home at that time. The very afternoon the bodies were being recovered from the impact site just north of town, he received one of the most unusual phone calls he would ever remember. It was the mortuary officer from the base hospital. His question, how soon could they ship out the smallest caskets they had available? And could they be hermetically sealed? Then the next call I got probably in 30, 45 minutes later, he was asking me then about our preparations and what we did uh, preparing the bodies that had been laying out in the elements or that, you know, some badly decomposed bodies or how we treated the burnt bodies, otherwise very traumatic uh, cases and what our procedure was on that. Then the next question was, well, what would you do where you wouldn't change any of the chemical contents, you wouldn't destroy any of the blood, you wouldn't destroy anything that might be very important uh, later on, you know, down the road. What would your process and what you do and the chemicals that you use, would that change the blood contents and everything? I knew at the time that there was something that probably happened. I thought maybe it was something that they weren't ready to release or there might be some VIP or something they didn't want. But I mean, I had no idea what it was, but uh, uh, I told him at the time, I said, you know, I can come out and I can help you if you have that. And he said, no, this is for future, in case this should happen in the future. He said, this is something we need to know so we'll know how to proceed. The phone calls continued to puzzle Dennis throughout the afternoon, to say the least. He would then have an opportunity to go check out for himself. It was taking an injured serviceman out to the base hospital and driving to the rear of the building that he observed some unusual material peering through the back of two open ambulance trucks. What I noticed that was so unusual about this, that there was some inscriptions or a border around this part of it. It was probably three inches, maybe around three inches, but it was it was kind of it was going along the the contour of the of the wreckage. And it, at the time, I, after I got back, I got to thinking about this and what the border looked like, and it kind of reminded me might be some it's kind of reminded me of an Egyptian inscriptions of figures and whatever. One of the nurses, lieutenant nurses that I was acquainted with very well. She uh, was very excited and she said, how did you get in here? What are you doing here? And get out immediately or you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. She said, get out of here as fast as you can. No sooner than the mortician could heed the warnings of his nurse friend, he attempted to leave, but was quickly accosted by two armed guards who led him out down the hallway. But I said, it looks like you've had a, looks like you've had a crash. And I said, I see some debris and then the ambulance is there. And that's probably where I really got in trouble right there. And he said, well, just a moment. And then he went to the door and he motioned for somebody. And about that time, there was two MPs that came out. They both, and he said, get this man out here, get him out here as fast as you can get him out of here. And then we were starting down the hall. And then uh, there was a man that they, we heard a voice said, I'm not through with that SOB yet, said, bring him back. The captain told me, the red captain told me, he said, there was no crash here, you did not see anything. And he said, you don't go into town, you don't tell anybody anything that you saw anything or anything else. He said, if you do, you will get in real serious trouble. Well, I was a little agitated because I didn't like the name he called me to start with. And I informed him, I said, look, I'm a civilian, you can't do a damn thing to me, and you, as far as I'm concerned, you can go to hell. And that was the exact words that I told him, and I remember it very clearly. 
Then the black sergeant, he said, oh, don't kid yourself, young man. He said, somebody be picking your bones out of the sand. She was going into this examination room that was across the hall. She was going in to get some supplies. And when she walked in the door, there was two doctors there. And uh, she noticed a horrible smell immediately. But she saw these two doctors and they said, we need you. You, you. She started out the door and said, you stay here, we've got to have you. And what it was, they were examining, uh, she told me, three bodies, foreign bodies. She said two of them were very mutilated. She almost, I knew she was almost in a state of shock because she was said it was so gruesome and so horrible, you know, and she would just, you know, almost grab her head and, and, and it looked like she was just going into total shock. She had drawn me just a little the night before she had a, a description of, of, of an arm that was uh, that she had drawn and then the anatomy of the arm, which was different from ours, there was only four fingers on, on the, the hand didn't have a thumb to it, only four very uh, slim, fragile little fingers. But when they turned one of the hands over, they noticed at the end of the fingers there was little, like little pads on each one of the four fingers there. And it looked to them like they were like little suction cups. They were little hollowed out areas that looked kind of like a suction, uh, suction cup. The heads on the, these individuals were much larger, somewhat larger than, than the human head would be. The eyes were very sunken. The nose was kind of, there wasn't a convex or anything. The nose was very concave with only two little orifices, the ears. There was no ear, the only might be two little orifices on the side, but very small little lobes that looked like they might function, they might close maybe or whatever, but they was very small. Nothing resembled uh, an ear on, on a human anatomy at all. The Marcel flight wasn't the only one. In the days that followed, other crews flew material out of Roswell. Captain O.W. Pappy Henderson flew a C-54 load of wreckage onto Wright Field. He kept that flight a secret from everyone, including his wife, Sappho, until the early 1980s. Then, after seeing an article in a tabloid, he told her exactly what he saw. We were in the grocery store in San Diego, where we had lived for many years, and uh, we were at the checkout stand, and here was a, a paper, the Globe, I believe it was. Uh, here was all of the, the story about it. In fact, I still have the papers here. And uh, he said, he took a, a look and he said, I've been wanting to tell you about this for years. I guess if they're putting in the papers now, it's no longer a top secret. And he said, he bought the papers and we went to the car and he said, read those. And I read the article and he said, it's a true story. He said, not only did I know about it, but I'm the pilot that took the crashed saucer to Dayton, Ohio. I was astonished, and uh, I, if it hadn't been uh, Pappy telling me, I probably wouldn't have believed it. But he was so, he was very confident, and he was always very truthful and straightforward. So I believed him, but if, you know, in those days, if you said you'd seen a spacecraft or a flying saucer, you were put in the uh, annals of a, a nut. <laughs> so I, uh, we didn't say much about this, but years before when people would ask him what he thought about uh, flying saucers, his answer was, there's something to it. Pappy Henderson, after seeing an article about the Roswell crash in 1982, mentioned the bodies to his daughter, Mary Catherine Grude. He told her a little more about them. What I remember him telling me was that they were small people. Um, I don't remember three feet high, but certainly shorter than we were, small people, uh, pale, uh, slightly slanted eyes, large, you know, sort of larger heads, and um, humanoid looking human-esque looking, but not like us, different from us. And uh, he said they were dead and that um, he had seen them and that he had flown the wreckage of this flying saucer. Pappy Henderson told a close personal friend and fellow military officer, Dr. John Chrome Schroeder, 
about the bodies in early 1978. Produce this uh, piece of metal for me to look at. He said, what do, what do I think of it? I said, well, it's, it's different. And when I felt it, and it did feel it, and I studied it some, I was able to determine that its uh, metal structure was uh, different than alloys like we have in our aircraft, for instance. And of course, he did uh, uh, preface his uh, question uh, by stating this was from this uh, craft. Apparently, uh, I think it was a case of uh, appropriation that he acquired this, you know, uh, for future study, perhaps. Porter's flight to Fort Worth with a small sample of the material and Henderson's special flight to Wright Field were the only aircraft dispatched. Like Henderson, other members of the first transport were involved in moving wreckage from Roswell to other locations. Robert E. Smith was a sergeant with the first air transport in July of 1947. According to him, he spent one day loading crates, which were loaded onto three C-54s. My involvement was to help load the crates of the debris onto the aircraft. Did you see what they were creating up? All, all I saw was was a little piece of material, about so big square. And you could crumple it up, let it out, and it would come out flat. And you could not crease it. One of the guys that was uh, in on the crating and so forth had picked up a piece, slipped it in his pocket. And where he is now, I don't know. Now, when I spoke with you on the phone, I mentioned about a distant cousin of mine that was uh, with the Secret Service. And we talked at length. And uh, I asked him, I said, where, where would they take something like that? I said, he said, well, he says, most likely Los Alamos. All of our secret stuff goes to Los Alamos. He didn't have any first-hand knowledge of this event, though. He was there. At Roswell? Yes. He came as more or less a representative of President Truman. Did you see him at Roswell? He saw me. But he didn't speak to you then? No. Did you discuss the specifics about what went on at Roswell with him in, in 72? Well, uh, some things. In other words, uh, he asked uh, what outfit I was with. And I told him, I said, the first ATU. He says, oh, you the guys flew it out. Backyard gossip at the UFO or something of that sort. He kind of grinned, he says, yeah. From first-hand testimony, we now know that there were two separate body flights that went out the early morning of July 6th. One directly to Andrews Army Airfield in Washington, the other to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. According to Staff Sergeant Robert A. Slusher, one of the crewmen on a B-29, they would later fly out a special flight on July 9th. It was uh, uh, July 9th, uh, 1947, and we left Roswell uh, with a crate and uh, we, we flew it to Fort Worth, uh, Coswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. What were you told was in the crate? Actually, when we left, we, were, we didn't know. Uh, no, we didn't know that in the crate that there was probably, uh, you know, something classified really till we got back and, and the kind of the rumors started talking around and, and you know, and. Uh, we did get a little flack as far as, as uh, that we we had taken something probably, and they were joking, joking about it to us, you know. But on on the way back, uh, we realized it was something classified, you know, and that they they didn't want us to talk about. We boarded the plane in the 393rd area, see right uh, right off of the operations really, and uh, uh, taxied down to the to the uh, to the uh, area where we picked up the the crate and they were MPs on there. I remember the MPs. Now you say MPs on there, you mean on the flight? Mm -hmm. Were they armed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Had the old standard 45. Any one member of your crew make any comments after you returned back to Roswell as far as concerning the rumors at that time? Did anyone say anything more definite? Well, that you can recall. Uh, one of the gunners said that uh, Lieutenant Martusi had 
and said that we, we had made history. According to Slusher and other members of that crew, Major Marcel was on the return flight from Fort Worth back to Roswell. There, Marcel was told not to say a word. In fact, he would then tell his family, who he had earlier presented some of the actual material to, that they should never say another word about the event. It was definitely not a weather balloon. And uh, it was an aircraft. So what it could have been, I wouldn't know. I still don't know. Major Edwin Easley was the Provost Marshal at Roswell in 1947. He was in charge of all military security at the impact site. Up to the moment he died, he still swore to us that he was unable to freely talk about the event. In other words, he had taken an oath of secrecy that he took to his deathbed. And I understand you were the Provost Marshal at one time. That's right. At the, at the 509th? Yes. Uh, during, during July of 1947? Oh, yeah. Pardon me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you're aware of the incident that took place there in July of 47? The uh, alleged crash of a flying saucer? I've heard about it. Um, did you, do you have any first-hand knowledge of it? Do what? Do you have any first-hand knowledge of the incident? I can't talk about it. Then you do have some first-hand knowledge? I can't talk about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, we had, we had, we have received information from a couple of people that, uh, that you had been out at the crash site yourself as a provost marshal. So that was what we were trying to confirm. But you can't talk about it, right? That's right. Can you tell me if you were at the crash site? I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. Yes, sir, I understand. I can't talk about it. Uh-huh. I'm not going to talk about it. After the balloon explanation, Roswell quickly faded into obscurity. There was no mention of it again. Personnel at the base were instructed never to say a word any longer about the case. And yet months after the event, Mac Brazo's son, Bill Jr., after heavy rainfalls, would ride out through that particular debris field site and occasionally would find a scrap of material he now describes what he found. He said that's what the Air Force tried to make him believe, that it was a weather balloon. And he said, Bill, he said it was not a weather balloon. He said, I don't know what it was. But he said it was something altogether different and much bigger. And I was talking about it. I went into Corona and I was sitting there in the beer joint and I up to these of course, my friends is asking me if I'd found any more or anything like this. And I said, well, I picked up a few scraps, uh, about a cigar box full. And uh, somebody, I don't know, must have informed the Air Force because first thing I know, I have visitors. And they say they'd like to have this material. And they didn't tell me they'd confiscate it. They just said, well, like we're going to have it one way or the other, you know. For the next 30 years, the story would lie dormant. Only rumors would occasionally circulate about the military possession of an actual flying saucer and its crew. Not until 1977, when Major Jesse Marcel broke his silence, went public, and then told the world about the true nature of what had happened at Roswell. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So we proceeded to pick up the parts, a lot of it had a lot of little members with symbols that to me I call them hieroglyphics because I could not interpret them, it could not be read. They were just like symbols of something that meant something. These little members could not be broken, could not be burned. I, I even 
tried to burn that. It would not burn. See, that stuff weighs nothing. It's not any thicker than tinfoil in a pack of cigarettes. Says, I tried to bend the stuff. Says, it will not bend. Says, we did all we could to bend it. It would not bend. Says, we even tried making a dent in it with a 16-pound sledgehammer. He says, still no dent in it. On September 8, 1994, the Air Force released its final statement through the Pentagon on the Roswell incident. They admitted they had lied and covered up the original incident. In reality, according to the Air Force report, it was nothing more than Project Mogul, a top secret acoustic listening program to detect the Soviet detonation of their own first atomic bomb. The problem with the report is that the particular launch in question was scrubbed. Launch number four, comprised of nothing more than a cluster of neoprene rubber balloons and radar reflector kites. The very same balloon that is originally pictured in General Ramey's office that was splashed across the country in many newspapers. So in essence, all they have done is redesign the weather balloon. With the release of its recent report, the United States Air Force has made it clear that the official government posture regarding Roswell shall remain that of unyielding secrecy, that great efforts shall be taken to discredit and debunk any and all attempts to prove that the crash was anything more than a weather balloon, and that by issuing their final report on the matter, the Air Force and all other government agencies hereby wash their hands of all responsibility to further answer to public demands. We are convinced that Roswell is perhaps the single best documented case implicating the United States military with long-term suppression of the truth. After six years of intensive research, 500 witnesses have come forward, over 100 of them retired military personnel who directly or indirectly participated in either the recovery or cover-up. Many who have gone public have stated unequivocally that Roswell was indeed the recovery of an extraterrestrial craft and crew. With the release of the report, the United States Air Force has once again attempted to bury the evidence with misinformation and media manipulation. We believe we have amassed enough evidence substantiating the claims of the witnesses. You have heard the witnesses present their case. It is now up to you to listen and to decide who indeed is telling the truth.